Today is Friday, April 19th, 2024, and it's about 8.59 p.m. Eastern Time, and we are live right outside the beautiful 432 Park Avenue building, right here in Midtown. Check it out. Now we're finally, finally, finally starting to uh, get some nice leaves on the trees here. The flowers are starting to bloom and hopefully the weather improves. No more rain, but I think I just checked the forecast. It's supposed to rain overnight, so we'll see. Uh, but a beautiful, beautiful, super tall building here. Now we need to talk about the markets because today was definitely, definitely a rough one on Wall Street. The S&P 500 closed down about 43 points, just about 1% closing below 5,000, 4,967. We'll check the NASDAQ. Check the NASDAQ 100 first. That was down about 345 points or about 2% on the day. Now, we're trading below the 50-day moving average on both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. And it looks like we're coming down to the 200 day. Now it's important to, you know, as we think about the S&P 500 as a market capitalization weighted index, it's very, very important to look at the individual components to sort of give us a better gauge of the health of the overall market. So the top 10 companies in the S&P are as follows. Number one is Microsoft. Number two is Apple. Three, NVIDIA. Four, Amazon. Five, Meta, six is Alphabet, uh, also seven is the class C shares, six is the class A shares, eight is Berkshire Hathaway, nine is Eli Lilly, and number 10 is Broadcom. Now, there's only two stocks uh, out of the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 that are trading above their 50-day moving averages. Those two stocks are Berkshire Hathaway, and number two is Google. You have Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon, Meta, Eli Lilly, and Broadcom, ticker symbol AVGO, trading below the 50-day. Now, it seems as if you're getting this massive rotation out of a lot of the beta, or I should say high, high beta names that have really been taking off throughout this bull market. You think about the tech stocks, you think about the AI plays, the semiconductors, the NVIDIAs of the world major major rotation coming out of those names and into safe haven names uh, we could tell this because just look at a lot of the etfs that track the utilities so if you take a look at ticker symbol xlu my internet would work uh, which is the spider select utilities fund that was up almost two percent on the day and it's up from $62 to $65 uh, since the beginning of the week. Uh, if you look at the XLE, which is the energy sector, that was also up on the day just over 1%. And then last but not least, the XLF, which is the financial sector, uh, that was also up about 1.5% or just about one point on the day while everything uh, was getting creamed, was getting really, really hammered pretty hard, particularly all of the tech sector. Um, guys, let's go ahead and uh, close up the laptop here. We'll say hello to everybody in the chat and we will get this stream started. Just as a quick reminder, last Thursday, we did send out our free investing newsletter. You can go ahead and subscribe to it. If you want to read all of our free research by scanning the QR code on your screen and punching in your email, it's going to take you to our Behind the Street newsletter. So with that being said, after the massive bloodbath on Wall Street, let's go ahead and check out the good old New York City. So give me a second and we will get started. You know, I feel like just in general, it was a very, very hectic and crazy day today, not even in the markets, but 
you know, in New York City. I'm sure everybody's heard there was some really, really unfortunate stuff happening in lower Manhattan, uh, in and around the area where Trump's uh, trial is, you know, crazy, crazy times. And uh, yeah, just a wild, wild day in general. So hopefully this week, hopefully this weekend will provide us some much needed relief um, away from all the craziness. All right, I see Carl Roth. What's going on? Patrick D. This is Thomas, long time no see. Yeah, it's good to have you back in the chat. It's a gorgeous night in Manhattan. Hopefully the rain will hold off. It's supposed to start raining probably right around midnight. We're on the corner of East 56th Street and Park Avenue, looking all the way down towards the one and only Grand Central Station. Solo 401, what's going on? El Nina, what's up? Shannon, UniJ23, Hawaii. Always a pleasure to have you in the chat. Good to see you. This is, yeah, super crazy and really, really sad. It's unbelievable, honestly, because uh, on the mental health crisis we have, not only in the country, but specifically in New York City, um, a lot of the outbursts and a lot of the crazy stuff that happens on the subway are from these people that obviously have like very, very severe mental health issues and it doesn't seem like they're getting the help they need. So it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Now this is Park Avenue and you have all of these, what are they, tulips, daffodils? They've planted hundreds of these all up and down Park. Looks pretty good. You're looking at the Aston Martin building or I should say the showroom. DM, what's up? Thanks for joining us. Sally is here. Road Dog says number one is gold, number 12 is silver, number 13 is Bitcoin. Good to see you, Road Dog. Yeah, gold held up pretty well, and today is the Bitcoin halving, by the way. For those of you who do not know what the Bitcoin halving is, uh, now the block rewards are cut in half. So Bitcoin is becoming more and more scarce by the day. Um, yeah, I mean, you had gold holding up pretty well today in the face of everything pretty much getting dumped on the street. Uh, big rotation out of these high beta names and into, you know, more of the defensive plates. Now, I think the, the biggest and most important thing that we need to pay attention to now, uh, a lot of people, when the markets go into correction, they kind of turn it off, so to speak. I think this is the time you need to double down because this correction is going to bring about unbelievable opportunities for us. Unbelievable. And it's important to watch when these leaders start to bottom out, start to build their bases and break back above those moving averages so you can get back into those names uh, that you missed during the first leg of the bull. Now, one of my rules is no new buys until you can see the major indices breaking back above the 50, and you can use those major moving averages as your guardrails, so to speak. Um, I think the S&P as of now is, what, 7%, like 6.5%, 7% uh, off from its new all-time record high. Kelly, this is big day. Good to see you, Kelly. Thanks for joining us. We're officially outside of 425 Park Avenue. This is the temporary headquarters to Citadel Securities until they could build their own super tall tower, which was just approved, by the way. That's some semi-breaking news in New York City. Ken Griffin from Citadel has partnered up with Steve Roth from Vernado. They are going to build a massive, super, super, super tall 350 Park Avenue that is going to be the new New York City headquarters for the hedge fund. I believe they're going to occupy the first 57 floors, which is wild. And it's going to compete with this building right here, 270 Park, Jamie Dimon. So Park Avenue, in my view, is really going to become the business core hub of New York City. I'd say, well, let me rephrase that. I'd say two main locations are gonna become the main, main business hub for New York. Number one is gonna be Park Avenue from 42nd Street all the way up to 57th Street, Billionaire's Row. And I believe number two 
is going to be the one and only Hudson Yards. We're already starting to see tons and tons and tons uh, of businesses move out of these older office towers uh, into the Hudson Yards. But look at that. It's cloudy in New York tonight because we're getting a little bit of a rainstorm rolling in. And the very top of 432 Park is hidden away in the clouds. It's a pretty cool shot. It's almost like an ominous looking shot, like you're in a Batman movie. All right, let's cross to the south side. Walter's here. Gary Carpenter, Alan, what's up? Carl Roth's Park Avenue is very exciting. It's even more exciting during the day because you have tons of foot traffic. People are in and out of offices. It's really nice. I know Doc7, Griffin, and Vernado, what a team. It's, uh, it's going to be pretty exciting, to say the least. Patrice2020, what's up? Stein says, hey, Tom. Sharon, NNB45, what's up? What's up? Any plans for the weekend? Anybody doing anything fun? I should be, uh, well, I should be in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. Not sure if anybody's familiar with that, but that's way, way out there. I believe it's the last stop on the D train. And I'll pretty much be there all day tomorrow. Well, up to about four o'clock. We're trying to structure another one of those garage deals uh, that we were briefly talking about yesterday. This is a cool shot, look at this. You have all of these planters outside this office building and you have a straight shot down to the MetLife building and Grand Central Station. Christian says you're going to the beach. Vincent says I'll be at Hudson Yards. Uh, assuming it doesn't rain, Hudson Yards in the High Line is probably going to be rocking tomorrow, which is fantastic. So super jealous. This is 399 Park. beautiful lobby. Now my favorite lobby of a New York City office building is the Nurburger Berman building on 6th Avenue. One more shot at the 432 Park building. Doc Seven says, what's up with Blackstone? Even though it had a good earnings report, it's dumping. Well, the market is in a correction, right? And markets go up, markets go down. And in a bull cycle, you're going to have corrections and pullbacks. Uh, data shows, <coughs> excuse me, data shows that an average correction or a normal market correction in a bull market uh, is between seven and 12%, which is we're kind of in that uh, range, so to speak, right now. But the thing that has been surprising is the velocity of the move. You know, usually you'll have two days deep red, a little bit of a, a bounce back, uh, and then a few other days down. This has been just like taking the freight train on a one-way ticket to hell. Right, so this has been some very, very serious selling. Uh, although, to kind of play devil's advocate and look on the other side, since October, we've been on a freight train directly straight up, right? If you look at the S&P on a weekly chart, since October, we've been, you know, 12 o'clock on a clock face uh, higher. So you're seeing a lot of those high beta names get dumped. And in general, seven out of 10 stocks will follow the overall trend of the market. So when the market is in correction, everything goes down, pretty much. Uh, Netflix had a great quarter. They reported yesterday after the bell. Uh, that stock, I think, was down 7% after hours. You know, uh, it's in the category. It's beta, so uh, it's gonna go down. Now, the only stocks today, when I was kind of running my screeners and scanners, a lot of the utility stocks were actually getting a major bid and that's kind of not what you want to see uh, that's essentially just the major institutions on Wall Street hiding out in those names 
right? So you had utilities performing really good. You also had financials getting a pretty big bid today. If you look at the XLF, I think that was up over 1%. Uh, and you also had energy. So those three categories were the bright spot in the market while everything else was down, you know, individual names were down double digits, right? Some of the very, very high octane names um, that really, really ripped during this cycle, some of them were down 20% in one day today. I think NVIDIA was down over 10%. Uh, breaking back below its 50-day moving average. And in general, semiconductors, if you look at ticker symbol SOXX, uh, or the SOX, uh, really, really taking it on the chin. The only bright spots in the market were, well, if we want to expand that to commodities and metals, gold held up really good. Uh, Bitcoin held up surprisingly good, probably because today is the happening. So there was a little bit of a catalyst there. Energy, right? The XLE, financials held up pretty good, and then you had utilities uh, holding up really, really well. So this was a, a flight to safety day, uh, and pretty much just dump anything that is high beta or high octane, pretty much. Hey, MD, what's up? Always a pleasure to have you here as we walk down Park Avenue. This is the Seagram building, right on the corner of 52nd and Park. Hey, John Kelly, this is greetings, Tom. 2024 Bitcoin having. Cheers. Yeah, that was today. Today was the day I was watching it. Pretty historic stuff, right? Now, this is an interesting change of character for Bitcoin because usually, right, if you look back throughout history, Whenever the NASDAQ is down 2% on the day, you could almost guarantee that Bitcoin would be down like 10% on that day alone. Uh, because cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin specifically tend to trade as very high beta, high speculative investments. That's how it's always traded. Doesn't matter, you know, what kind of spin you try to put on it to say, you know, Bitcoin is a store of value, this and that. Historically, it's traded very, very volatile and it's tracked that of the NASDAQ probably times two. But today was a pretty interesting change of character. You had Bitcoin holding up, kind of mocking that price movement of gold, those hard precious metals, uh, while the NASDAQ 100 specifically, I think closed down 2% on the day. Look at this place. This is an interesting outdoor dining Place. Doesn't look like anybody's here, though. There's a few people dining inside, but... Fresco, it's called. Hey, Isabella says, are you walking towards 732 Park? I don't think so. We just, we just uh, got off Park Avenue. And we're heading further into Manhattan. So we're now crossing Madison. This is looking uptown on Madison Avenue. Wow, look at this. The top 25% of 432 Park is completely covered in the clouds. This is the Omni Berkshire place. Now, when I was in college, I didn't have enough money to buy the Wall Street Journal. So I would actually come in here into the lobby. And this is a really nice hotel. And they always, every morning, they have the Wall Street Journal and New York Times uh, laid out on the uh, really big tables there. They also have it at the Essex House. So I would go in there and take a paper. Hey, Abdullah, what's up? Happy Friday, TGIF. John says hello from freezing Colorado. Well, it's not too, not too uh, much different here in New York. We're going to get rain again coming in.
This is the Farragamo store on the right. And this is gonna take us back right on the main drag here on Fifth Avenue. Lark Barks says, hey Tom and everybody. Good to see you on this extremely, extremely negative, volatile day on the street. You know, I do feel that New York is quite quiet tonight. I do feel that. Maybe as we go towards 6th Avenue, it'll pick up a bit, but I do get a feeling that New York is a bit quiet tonight. Maybe there's a game going on, I don't know. But even though, uh, even during the day, like even during the work day today, very, very, very quiet. Not a lot of people were in the office at all. I was reading uh, that article again, the CEO and founder of Point72 Asset Management, Steve Cohen. He really thinks that in our lifetime, we're going to have four, four day work weeks because AI is going to drive so much efficiency that you're not even going to have things to do. It's going to take the five day work week down to four. Oh, I think you're right. Uh, Peters is uh, it is quiet because Passover week starts on Monday. I think you're I think you're correct There are a lot of people out of the office now. This is the old Versace store. This was the flagship No longer the Versace store anymore. This is um, Well temporary it's the Eden Fine Art Gallery, which it actually looks like they took all of the art out So it may have just been a small pop-up shop but the building is unbelievable. The facade is amazing. Let's actually cross the street just so we can kind of take a look in it. I'm curious to see what they're going to put in here again. I mean, this is such a gorgeous building and it's totally vacant. Ah, dollar bill. Yeah, I think YouTube changed some of the settings. Which is a bit of a pain in the you-know-what, by the way. So I have to physically go behind the scenes on the stream and make sure that you can rewind the live stream. And I forgot to do that tonight. Alright, everybody, this is a behind-the-scenes look of the inside of the Versace store. This was the flagship here on Fifth Avenue. And this used to be, all but a few days ago, the Eden Fine Art Gallery pop-up. Interested to see what kind of establishment's gonna take this over. We'll see. Brad says, Tom, you know the four day uh, week will never happen in America, we're Americans, we work. I tend to agree, I tend to agree with you, but you never know. If all of these predictions and projections about AI are true, I definitely wouldn't be surprised if it happens. Who knows? Um, did anybody see the new prototype of the robot that Boston Dynamics is building? Anybody see that? Now, that's crazy stuff. One of the things that I was talking about with a friend of mine is that just how nowadays everybody has a car, pretty much. I mean, if you're not from New York, you probably have a car. There's probably gonna come a time within my lifetime, right? Where instead of everybody having a car, they'll also have like a personal robot assistant uh, to help them out around the house, to do, you know, chores, run errands, everything. And I could definitely see that. Right, and then there's probably going to come a time where, you know, people are watching YouTube unboxing reviews of, oh, should you get the Tesla bot? Should you get the, you know, the Boston Dynamics robot? I think in every single household across the United States, you're going to have some sort of robot assistant to do things. I think that's coming. You can see all these big tech companies investing billions of dollars in research and development 
to make these robots uh, better. And that's what Elon Musk is investing a lot of money into, the new Tesla robot. I don't know. Um, it's possible. And I also think there'll come a time where vehicles will be fully, fully autonomous. Not like the autonomous driving we have now, but absolutely, completely, 100% autonomous that will not, you won't have to have a human at all in operation, which I think is good. Some people think it's bad. I actually think it's good because the number one factor in auto accidents and collisions is the human error element, right? Robots don't make mistakes. Uh, machines don't make mistakes, or very, very seldom, as opposed to what a human makes. So I think that's going to make things a lot safer, and you'll pretty much take drunk driving and take it to zero. Uh, drinking and driving will be a thing of the past, and think about how many people and how many families were destroyed by drinking and driving. That's going to be a complete thing of the past. MD says, I read they are recalling all 4,000 Tesla Cybertrucks. I read the same thing too. Now, I believe what happened with that is there was a malfunction with the gas pedal where they used some adhesive that wasn't approved. So if the adhesive ever comes off, the brake uh, or the gas pedal could slide forward and it would just hold the car, the accelerator down, uh, essentially in perpetuity. So that's a major issue, but I think a pretty quick fix but you're right every single cyber truck was recalled but I don't know um, what do you all think of the future of autonomous vehicles and robots in general super white shadows as we are headed towards a dystopian society I don't know. I'd like to be more optimistic than that. I know it kind of sounds weird and crazy now, but, you know, maybe in 10 years it'll seem normal. All right, everybody, we are here at the beautiful Rockefeller Center, and we are looking at the one and only Saks Fifth Avenue. Uh, Christians is an advancements with ChatGPT being more real time with information, for sure. I think that these AI chatbots are really going to eat into the business model of Google search, but that's just my opinion. Oh, Wise Owl says I want my Tesla to be driving Uber while I'm at work. That could be a reality. Now, to Old Wise Owl's point, right? Let's say if that's a possibility. If your Tesla could have full self-driving and it could drop you off at work. Oh, look at this. This is cool. I was gonna say, let's try to go down here, but they closed it off. Maybe it's not open for the season yet, but you know, last year, I'm not sure if you guys remember, they had a big roller skating rink. So instead of the ice skating, they replaced it with roller skating. Doesn't look like they're gonna do that this year. Uh, but anyway, you know, is it a possibility that if you have a Tesla it could drop you off at work, go back home, pick your kids up, take your kids to school, drop your kids off at school, and then go work the entire day driving Uber. What is that gonna do for Uber stock? You know, think about that. Um, what is the largest expense for Uber right now, probably? It's the labor, it's the employees. If you don't have any drivers and it's just an autonomous vehicle that's, you know, maybe on a profit sharing system, is that going to explode gross margins at Uber? It's possible. I, I think the, the world of possibilities with 
full autonomous driving is going to be so unbelievable that we can't even potentially it's not a bad idea Carl Roth says Tom Uber definitely needs competition well they have Lyft Uber, Lyft um, what are some of the other ones I know in Korea they don't have Uber they have something else I think Ah, check the logic says no, Tom, you won't even own the car. Maybe. Yeah, maybe you'll just have, like, uh, companies will own fleets of autonomous vehicles. This is the Rainbow Room. Oh, yeah, Action Kids. There's Revel. Now, another interesting thing that AK told me about is in Miami... We have these things called freebies, I think. Maybe they're here, I don't know. But in and around specific places in Miami, there's these Teslas that you could take for free. I believe the application is called Freebie, I think. They're all around North Miami Beach. I think there's some in downtown Miami. But it's kind of cool. Uh, I think you just call it. There's, there's Sunny Isles Beach one. I've seen North Miami Beach. And it's essentially a free taxi service. And all of them are Teslas. I don't know who pays for that. Maybe it just comes out of the tax money, but it's interesting. Jeff says, do they have zip cars everywhere? Man, zip car, that's a throwback. I don't even know if Zip, zip Car is still around anymore. I remember the garage I used to work at used to have Zip Cars. Road Dog says you don't own your house, you have to pay taxes. Yeah, I guess you're renting the land, I guess you could call it, from the government. But, I mean, you can't, you can't get away from taxes. That's just uh, what you have to deal with. Oops. There are too many variables in the driving environment. Potentially... Um, Action Kids is the F3B. They're not Teslas, though. I, I just took a picture of a few of them in North Miami Beach. They were driving around. Uh, they were Teslas, 100%. Ah, noodles as we're buffering. Yeah, sometimes on this corner, it's not the best internet let's see if we head uptown if it'll help out with the buffering and all but in terms of there be too many kind of variables for the full autonomous driving I think in more newer cities and smaller cities it'll be a possibility um, there's already like I think some Domino's pizza locations in Arizona they have full autonomous delivery vehicles I think they use Chevy Cruises to do that so if you order a pizza there's not an actual individual person that comes and delivers your pizza it's a full AI well it's a full autonomous vehicle um, that delivers your food for you Yeah, AK says, I just looked up their website. Uh, the new Tesla freebies look amazing. They do. And they're driving around Sunny Isles Beach. They're all around downtown Miami. It's, uh, yeah, it's, pre it's a pretty cool perk. I've never taken one personally, but I always see them driving around. And here we have Radio City Music Hall to our right. William says, Tom, when are you doing a Miami trip? Call a Tesla ride, what do you think? Sure, next time in Miami, I'll try to take one and test it out. I'm not opposed to it. It's 
So for instance, once a vehicle makes a mistake, it learns not to do it again. Well, that's what a lot of people are saying about Tesla in general. A lot of analysts on Wall Street want to evaluate Tesla as a traditional auto OEM. And many people are saying that's a big mistake because it's a big data play. I mean, if you want to talk about data, I mean, Tesla's got it. Now, the stock has been getting absolutely hammered. It's been getting slaughtered. I think the stock is down 60% from record highs at Tesla. Rocky Rocks. Uh, it says, Tom, Teslas don't have any resale value and won't even start in sub-zero. Majority of people buying Tesla have dumb money, like inheritance or sugar daddy's money. That's an interesting take. I don't know if there's any data to back that. I mean, what data, what data set are you pulling from that most people that drive a Tesla have sugar daddy's money? Interesting data set. Maybe you're right. I'm not saying you're wrong. Uh, but you are correct about the resale value is getting absolutely destroyed. But that's because Elon Musk has been cutting prices. And it's kind of like a short-term pain, long-term gain. If the vision is to have affordability, like true affordability, like where everybody can afford to have a Tesla, you're going to need to cut prices. Uh, and you got to do it at some point. And yes, that is going to impact the resale value of people who unfortunately bought when prices were higher. But that's part of the long-term plan, you know, according to Elon Musk. So you are correct that people who bought Teslas over the last two years are getting absolutely killed in their resale value. Um, you're right. Rocky Rocks says, so you see yourself, the majority, of Tesla, the majority of Tesla drivers are young girls. I don't know about that. I think we could actually probably pull the data on that. And I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that's the case, but not saying you're wrong. Ah, that makes sense. MD says it explains Elon cozying up to the new president of Argentina. Lithium and crypto mining. Well, didn't Elon Musk come out and say a little while ago that if there's any entrepreneurs out there, he really suggests getting into the lithium mining business? And he said he'd be their first customer. NAV407 says, not true. Tesla still has the highest profit margin in the industry. Tesla holds value better than most cars. Yeah, but there's over the last year, there's been significant margin compression. Significant. Uh, and I think that's why you're seeing the big implosion in the stock price. But again, the long-term play, and Elon has said this on the earnings calls, uh, they had to cut prices, right? Now, unfortunately, that would impact resale value, obviously, because if you bought at the higher price when you could just buy something new at a lower price, well, a lot of Tesla, current Tesla owners are upset. Now, over time, you're probably going to have margin recovery, right, or margin expansion. And that's probably right around the time where you're going to see the stock price recover. Um, but for now, that is... pretty much throwing good money after bad. I think we just hit an, uh, a 52 week low again today on Tesla. So we'll see, you know, if the thing starts to snap back and build the base. Oops, let me cross here. Uh, we'll monitor the earnings. We'll cover it here for sure. 
Nate Webbs, how many Teslas have you walked past just in the last three minutes? Probably 50, honestly, probably a lot. Stance's repair costs for Tesla are high, higher than gas guzzlers. MD says yes. Uh, interesting. Robin says, says, how is the Substack newsletter coming? It's coming good. We just sent out the uh, our last issue on Thursday. Check your email. Yeah, I saw that. Um, MDs is Tom, the guy in the front of the courthouse today. Did you read the substack on Peter Thiel and BTC? I didn't. Uh, are you talking about the guy who lit himself on fire, unfortunately? I saw it. Someone sent me the video. It's just, it's absolutely horrible. Now, I know this guy had a big manifesto, which I refused to read. And I think everybody should refuse to read it, in my opinion. And I don't think the media should, I don't think the mainstream media should really cover it uh, and send it out there. But I can guarantee it's probably running on repeat on CNN and Fox News. Because things like that are serious, right? And people have, you know, unfortunately, very, very severe mental health issues. And that individual had very, very severe, severe mental health problems. And if you shine a spotlight on that, you know, there's no shortage of people in New York City with severe mental health issues. So you don't want to, you know, kind of make a hero out of these people because that's going to promote that kind of behavior again. So I'm not going to read the substack from that guy. It's really, really horrible. You know, uh, you know, we briefly talked about this at the beginning of the live stream, but it just, that exposes not only the severity of the mental health crisis in the United States, but more specifically here in New York City. It's really, really bad. And people aren't getting the help that they need, and they feel that they need to resort to lighting themselves on fire. That's pretty sick. It's pretty disgusting. So it's an it's a issue. I mean, I'm just, you know, the only positive thing you could take out of it is thank god he didn't do that on a crowded subway car right you know it's uh it's unfortunate well it looks like times square is picking up a little bit is West 51st Street. Oh, look at this. Streaming soon. Wonder what that is. It looks like a restaurant, doesn't it? It looks like a dim sum restaurant. Emmanuel says Inside Edition blames it on Trump. Well, Inside Edition is not even a real publication. I don't even know how that's still in business. Yeah, Brad says watching the media and the news is bad for your health, honestly, for sure.
Oh, steaming soon. That's my dyslexia. <laughs> Dude, I read that as streaming soon. Steaming soon. I am, I am honestly, like, for real, though, uh, dyslexic. But I probably mixed it up because we always say streaming. Probably a mix of both. All right, let's head uptown a little bit. There was supposed to be a big tea place that opened up just here on the left. Yeah, crazy autos just trying to avoid the news, yeah. Well, now when I say, uh, when we say avoid the news, I don't mean become oblivious to things. I mean just don't psychoanalyze it. Like, I was given a really, really good piece of advice. And, you know, if there's something major that happens, somebody will tell you about it, right? So if there's something major, major breaking news that you need to know about, you know, you'll probably get a text from a friend, your boss or something. You can, you know, bet almost 100% that you're going to know about it. So you don't need to overindulge in the news and listen to all these political commentators get you riled up. It just is like a toxicity mental psyop, honestly. And I also think it'll probably drive your anxiety. There's, there's already enough things in this life to be anxious about you know if you watch CNN and Fox News every night I mean I don't know how people can get out of bed in the morning you'd be so scared of everything all right we're headed up by the Ed Sullivan Theater this is the late show with Stephen Colbert in between West 53rd Street and West 54th Street, right on Broadway. Now, I'm really excited about this development site here. If you see right on the corner of West 54th Street and Broadway, this building has been vacant for over a decade, well over a decade. And what you're looking at right here with all the scaffolding, this used to be the headquarters of Bad Boy Entertainment or Bad Boy Worldwide, which is Sean Combs or P. Diddy's record label used to be right here. This used to be the main entrance. I believe Extel acquired the building. Don't quote me on that though. But they're going to do an internal demolition, which means they're essentially going to rip it down to its bare bones. And this should be condos or mixed use. We'll go over and check it out though. Um, this building dead centered here is the backside of 157 West 57th Street. That's the first building ever constructed on New York City's Billionaire's Row. And then you have right here, which is Central Park Tower, which is the same developer as 157. The developer is Gary Burnett from Extel. And the building with the gold top right here, that's 220 Central Park South. That is Steve Roth's company. Vernado was the developer. Now, if you watch the stream, just when we started, we were talking about another pretty exciting development that's going to go up right on Park Avenue. The building is called 350 Park. If you want to Google some of the renderings, it's awesome. 
And that is going to be a partnership with Vernado and Ken Griffin's Citadel, or Citadel's Ken Griffin. It's going to be a super tall um, commercial office building right on Park Avenue. And Citadel is going to occupy the first 57 floors, I believe. So as we walk the city and we talk about some of these notable developers, you'll notice how there's a select few developers on like the groundbreaking, amazing projects, right? There's about a handful that claim the limelight, so to speak. Peter says, when is 350 scheduled to be completed? Um, you know, that's, good. that's a good question. I don't know. Maybe somebody could Google that. I'm actually curious about that too. When is 350 Park scheduled to be completed? Wow, it's crazy seeing this. This used to be the main entrance right here. This used to be a big awning that said Bad Boy Entertainment, Bad Boy Worldwide. You know, there's a lot of empty and vacant retail store frontage here though. This is a prime location right here on Broadway, but honestly, it's not very well foot traffic during the day. It's really not. In between Columbus Circle and 42nd Street on Broadway, not a whole lot of foot traffic, to be honest. It's mainly like tourist traffic here and there, but you know, the majority of the office stuff is further in Midtown or further south or east on Park. That guy's shirt says, ask me about the COVID-19 vaccine. What do you think he knows about the vaccine? Just kidding. This is West 55th and Broadway. This is another stunning looking building. This is a hotel, but you also have an Italian restaurant in the basement. Wow, Peter says so in about three years, we'll see it, 2027. Somebody should really make a time lapse of the construction of that building. Now, this is relatively new. I'd say about a year and a half. During the pandemic, during COVID, this all used to, everything pretty much here used to be vacant. You know, another part of town that really recovered nicely from the pandemic is that stretch uh, from Broadway on 32nd Street down to 23rd Street. That used to be completely blown out. And when I mean blown out, there was, you know, 100% vacancy. Now there's restaurants, there's shops. They actually made it really, really nice. Uh, maybe we'll have enough time to go check it out tonight. I would say that made a, a complete and full recovery and then some from the pandemic. see 432 again and the one and only Carnegie Hall let's go around the block and we'll go on 8th hey the eyeglass lady is here Always a pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining us. As we stroll through Midtown on this Friday night. Oh, you know what I was going to tell you guys? I went with my coworker today to check out this apartment for a potential buyer. 
It was in 100 Central Park South, which is the Trump Park East building. So you, have, you really have two buildings, and I'm going to tell you why this is relevant. Uh, because it goes along with our conversation of potential mispricings in the market. So you have the main building, which is Trump Park, which is 106 Central Park South. You could look it up on Street Easy, Zillow, uh, and whatnot. But then you have Trump Park East, which I believe is 100 Central Park South. And a lot of those units there have been on the market for a long time. And even the ones that have technically not been on the market for a long time, they've been on and off the market for a while, like for years. And they're having a really hard time selling those and moving them. And we were talking to the listing broker, a really nice guy, really successful guy. And, you know, the name, just the Trump name has been, especially in New York, you know, one of the most liberal cities on the planet, um, have been making it very, very difficult to move. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like, okay, number one, I get it. But number two, a piece of real estate, guys, is a piece of real estate, right? You're living in it, location, location, location. You're right on Central Park South. So if you look at some of those units, right? And I won't, I won't give you the answer. I'll let, you, I'll let you guys do a little bit of homework. Maybe I'll give you the answer a little bit later in the stream. But I want you to do an analysis of the price per square foot on, uh, well, let's say this. Take the median price per square foot at 106 Central Park South and 100 Central Park South and do a comparative analysis on all of the other condominiums and co-ops on Central Park South. And don't necessarily look at the list price. Try to look at some of the comps of just the most recently traded. And you're going to be astonished. I mean, you're talking about like a 20% to 25% discrepancy. That's pretty significant. Uh, and even in some cases for some of these off-market deals that I've heard that have transacted, some of these have been going at fire sales just because they were in a building that had the Trump name on it. So my thought is, are people really willing to pay more just because of the name on the building? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So what if at any point in time this building sells to some other person, right, to some other entity, and it doesn't have the Trump name on it anymore? Is that just going to be an automatic re-rate to the statistical median price per square foot on Central Park South? Right? Or what if it becomes under another, you know, company or management company or whatnot, right? It just it doesn't have the name Trump Park. Or maybe they do a rebrand. It's very, it's interesting. And the reason why I bring it up, I'll get right to the point. Just as in the stock market, right, in equities, what really drives price at the end of the day, right, I should say in general, in the most part, it's emotion, right? Fear and greed drive price. So there's always opportunity in the market and when you're speaking with other brokers, when you're talking to other people, you can really get a better glimpse of what market participants are saying, how they're acting. And it's just so strange because it's all the same real estate on Central Park South. Um, and some of the units are actually more premium than some of these older buildings. So it's just interesting. It's very, very interesting to see. Um, now, not to ramble on, but this building here right here the address is one central park west now this is the trump international hotel and tower there's two components we might as well take a walk there because i also want to tell you guys about 15 central park west um now there's a hotel component where you can buy individual units in the hotel kind of like a timeshare deal. It's actually not a good investment, not being political. I've actually read the numbers on these deals. It's more of like a pied-a-terre style, but they don't cash flow. Uh, you can buy individual hotel rooms in the Trump International Hotel. When you're not there, it goes into the hotel pool and gets rented out at, say, you know, whatever the rate is, $720 to $1,000 a night. 
But you could also go on the other side of the building and purchase regular condos. And these condos are actually ridiculously nice. Like I'm talking about stunningly, stunningly nice. Now, before I joined the Kirsten Jordan team at Douglas Elliman, right before I joined, uh, my boss had an amazing $35 million listing in this, in this building. And she was telling me it was obviously a, an international owner from Asia, and it was so difficult to move. We wound up losing the listing because we couldn't get anyone to buy it. And I think the Alexander team has it now. So, and I don't think it's sold yet. So if you, if you look up on Street Easy, uh, 1 Central Park West, I think it's still listed at like 35.5. And it's very difficult to move. So it gets me thinking, what if this didn't have the Trump name on it? Would those $35 million apartments be 40 million? I don't know. It's fascinating. It's really, really fascinating. And here it is right now. Uh, Deborah says, love the info. Thank you so much. It's very interesting. It is really interesting. Now, these views are incredible because not only do you have Central Park views that are unobstructed, but you could see all of New York City's Billionaire's Row. You know, if you live in a Billionaire's Row building, you obviously can't see your neighbors on Billionaire's Row. Uh, you can't see all the cool architecture, but if you're in this building, you can. Let me stand up on this bench so you guys can see a little bit better. So there's three distinct doors here. You guys see them? Three doors. We'll quickly review each one. Door number one, this is a Michelin star restaurant. It's a steakhouse, Jean George. It's a very good, but it's, you know, honestly, it's uh, not to ruffle anybody's feathers. There's a lot better steakhouses for much, like a lot more affordable pricing, I think, in the city. But anyway, the middle door is the hotel. That is the Trump International Hotel in the middle door. And on the right, that is the residences. So if you rent or own a condo, you would go in right here. I believe the first 16 floors of the building are the hotel, which you can kind of tell because all of the lights are on, right? This hotel actually does really well in terms of occupancy. But once you pass the 16th floor, a lot of the units are dark because there's many international buyers, a lot of people pied a terre. Uh, but in general, the views are amazing here. And it's right next to 15 Central Park West. Uh, but if you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight, feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. We do these streams almost every single day, starting at 8.30. Now, this building was the one we were just talking about. That's the first building ever built on Billionaire's Row. And you could see the full 83rd floor of the building lit up. That was actually on the market not too long ago. I want to say four months ago. Um, now, a really, really notable broker noble black had that listing i actually went to the broker open house it was the most unbelievable apartment i've ever been in in my life it was the full 83rd floor of that building they listed it i believe for 34 million two weeks later it went under contract for 32 million and sold and it looks like somebody's home maybe they're having a party And then this is the Steinway Tower. That's the skinniest residential apartment building in the entire world. And Central Park finally is starting to have some leaves spring up here. Hey, Jonathan from Florida. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. We're now technically on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is one of my favorite neighborhoods. And this building right here is really nice too. This is 15 Central Park West. 
They nicknamed it the Limestone Building. And it was completed in 2008 during the depths of the financial crisis. But even though it was, it was uh, you know, completing sales, or I should say completing construction during the financial crisis, it sold really, it sold really well. Uh, which just goes to show that when you're dealing with that level of wealth, there's really never a bear market at that level. Uh, and they were commanding record, record sales there. They still are, but obviously now they're resales. They're not sponsor units. But this building is very famous for having a lot of big, notable names on Wall Street. So right here at 15 Central Park West, I believe the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankenfein, has his primary residence. There's also a lot of famous uh, VC investors, private equity people that call 15 Central Park West home. It's a great location. And there you have it. Overlooking all the billionaires row too. Hey, RPT is joining us. Good to see you. This is happy Friday. Happy Friday to you too. And boy, do we uh, need a little bit of a break. This week on Wall Street was a killer. Uh, markets getting slaughtered. A lot of the high beta names absolutely crucified today. Trevor says, what are some of the safe and unsafe parts of the city? I mean, the city's huge. That's what a lot of people don't understand. But the city, are you talking about Manhattan? Because a lot of times when people say the city, they, they're talking about Manhattan. Or are you talking about all of the boroughs? Uh, Theo says, do you have lawyers uh, in your real estate offices? I think at 575 Madison, there is an attorney's office. I just don't remember the attorney's names or I don't remember the name of the law firm. Now, in terms of the deals that I do, I tend to stick and use the same attorneys over and over and over again, just because it's easier to, you know, deal with who you know. So I use a company called Star Associates. Look at this Rolls Royce here. Parked directly outside of the Trump International Hotel and Tower. Now, there is this uh, very boutique investment bank that's in the building, too, and I, it was a, kind of an interesting deja vu moment because when I first started my sales career, I think it was like 19 or 20. Turns out I actually had a meeting with this guy at Brittany Capital. Uh, Raymond, I think it was his name, Raymond. And it was at 575 Madison. Brittany Capital. And I think I was trying to sell him some SD WAN product or something like that. He never bought anything from me, but he was a nice guy. Uh, and now I'm working in the same building. I've never seen him though, never, never see, seen him again. I always try to look out for him when I'm in the elevator in the lobby, but... I just noticed that there's scaffolding here for whatever reason, which is strange. Maybe they're going to be doing some work on the hotel. This is the main entrance to the subway. Someone's saying, does Jamie Dimon live there? Definitely not. I don't think Trump and Jamie Dimon get along too well. At least I don't think so. Now, speaking of Jamie Dimon and speaking of Bitcoin, because today was the Bitcoin halvening. For those of you who are interested in that, you know what I don't understand? I don't understand why every time there's a Jamie Dimon interview on CNBC, on Bloomberg, on Reuters, on Fox Business, the journalist asks the guy the same question over and over and over and over again. 
I don't understand that. Is it just for like for the soundbite? I don't think anybody's interested in what Jamie Dimon has to say about Bitcoin. He says the same thing over and over and over again. He doesn't like it. He thinks it's a Ponzi scheme. We get it. We know his position. But every single Jamie Dimon interview out there now, they just hammer this guy on cryptocurrencies. I just don't understand it. Anyway, I guess it's just that's what drives the clicks, right? It gets all the crypto people all riled up. All right, Deutsche Bank Tower, formerly known as the Time Warner Center. That's true. MD says they do the same with Buffett. Stan says Christine Lagarde does not uh, like cryptocurrency either. Well, I mean, that's kind of obvious, right? Like, big shocker, Christine Lagarde, you know, head of one of the world's largest central banks, doesn't like Bitcoin. Big shock, right? If anything, that's probably like a screaming endorsement for Bitcoin. If Christine Lagarde doesn't like it. All right, let's make this right on 8th Avenue. We've now officially completed the entire lap around Columbus Circle. There's an underground market here where they have like coffee shops, different types of food, everything. Stan says she said it was worthless. Yeah, but you know, it's with, with fiat currency, over time fiat currency is by definition going to be worthless. Uh, I think now the Indian rupee has gone to zero uh, against Bitcoin. The Korean won, I think, is also zeroed against Bitcoin. But, I mean, just think about anything that you've purchased in your entire life. So chances are, if anybody's watching this broadcast, and let's just say you're over the age of 55, right? Just throwing a number out there. What was the price that you bought your first home? I guess that's the like that's the that's the best question to to kind of make this point. That's like a good barometer. If you're over the age of 55 and let's say if you're a New Yorker, maybe you lived on Long Island, maybe you lived in Brooklyn, or I don't know, maybe you lived in Manhattan, who knows. What did you spend for your first home? And I think that should be a pretty big tell. And it's, it's double as interesting because there was some data that came out that said since the year 2020, right? We all know what happened in 2020, pandemic, right? The median income, ooh, what happened here? Hope everything's all right. It doesn't seem to be anything going on. It just seems that the NYPD is just blocking the bus lane. Maybe they had to respond to something in the subway. Well, the average salary that it takes to buy a home went up 46% since 2020. Crazy Autos is on 50, but my parents bought a nice one for $250,000. Uh, Daytona Gal says $8,000 in 1968. Wow. Imagine the days where you could buy a house for $8,000. Robert Bankers says West Islip in 1986. You bought it for $165K. Noodles says over 55 is a large age gap. My parents bought their first house on Long Island for $28,000. Wow. Crazy, crazy, right? 
Now, I'm familiar with a lot of those towns. I'm from Massapequa. And I'll just ask like a, a very condescending question. Can you buy a house on Long Island for $70,000 or even $160,000? The answer is no. The, <laughs> the answer is no, you cannot. You know, in a lot of these towns in Nassau, Suffolk County, if you're talking about a single family home where you don't have to do too much renovation to it, you know, a lot of times, like the most basic entry level home where you don't have to spend a fortune doing a lot of renovations and that stuff, you know, you're looking at, you know, well over 550. If you want to be in a nice town, you're looking at 700 plus for just a starter home uh, on Long Island. So what does that say about the valuation of the dollar? Now you could ask yourself, does that mean home values went up or did purchasing power go down? I don't know. Um, hey, Hang With Mark Mom is joining us. What's up? Mike Skate TV says you have family there. Master Peak was a wonderful town. Five bags of popcorn says Tom. My first place was Los Olas, Fort Lauderdale, 70,000 in 1997. Wow. Rick Bees is here in Sydney, 625K in 2008. Stan says my house went up about 20% in the past year or so. Yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, a lot of people are putting in the chat, you know, they're talking about South Florida. You know, some of these homes in South Florida, you know, some of these modest communities just before the pandemic. So I'm talking about, you know, just 2018, 2019. Some of these homes were selling for a quarter million bucks, right? Now, if you go on... If you go on Zillow, you know, $450,000, $550,000, $650,000 for, you know, three bedroom, two bathroom homes. It's insane. It's crazy. Things doubled, if not tripled, in some locations. Um, now, granted, there's a major, major economic boom in South Florida, which is bringing a lot of good jobs. But you also have collateral damage on the other side, right? Because we have to take into consideration the people who have lived in South Florida forever. And they're not necessarily benefiting from, you know, maybe they didn't get a raise. Maybe they don't have all that savings. They're being priced out of their rentals. They're being priced out of ever being able to afford a home. So it's a problem. All right, everybody. Look at this. Carnegie Hall. Looks like there's a big show getting out. Uh, 30 minutes of euphoria. Says, I think my parents paid uh, $80,000 in the 1980s. Jimmy B says, Tom, I bought in Bergen City, New Jersey uh, in 87 for 190,000. Now it's worth 825K. Wow, great trade, Jimmy. Yeah, so I mean, take Jimmy B's example, right? And, you know, I'm not gonna assume anything, but let's just say that, you know, Jimmy B's home is, you know, you would say like, you know, a regular home that, you know, a family would live in, maybe have a wife or a husband and two kids, whatever. 870, that's, that's steep. I mean, even on a dual income, that's pretty steep. I'm curious. We're just going to cross the street real quick. I want to see who's playing at Carnegie Hall. But if you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight, feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. Hey, Beach Fox is Long Beach, bought for 600K in 2000, gutted it, and now $3 million. Oh, are you talking about Long Beach, New York, or Long Beach? California, either or. Fantastic, my friend. 
three big ones. Three milli, milli, milli. I don't know if we're gonna be able to see who's playing here. Too many people coming out, but we'll try. Usually they have a sign that shows who is playing. Oh, Beach Fox is Long Beach, New York. Love that. Cool. <laughs> now, Long Beach, New York was hammered during Hurricane Sandy. I actually was there for the cleanup. And I remember the boardwalk was in pieces. Literally, the boardwalk was in pieces all over the shore. And there was about two feet of sand pushed all the way up on Shore Road, uh, all the way by the Long Island Railroad tracks. It was crazy there during Sandy. And many of the homes still haven't even recovered. Um, you know, the ones that have recovered, they actually put up on stilts, which is wild. Yeah, that whole area, like uh, Long Beach, Center Avenue, Island Park, Oceanside is another town. They've elevated these homes and put them up on stilts. But Long Beach, New York is a beautiful, beautiful town. It's just a little bit too windy for me. 80% of the year you can't even go outside. But in the summer it is quite nice. All right, let's head by the Russian tea room. Wow, Beach Fox. This is Tom. I watch Sandy from my terrace overlooking the ocean. I'm next to Magnolia Park. Yeah, that was... Uh, insane now beach fox you're probably familiar with those brand new rentals and those condos going up right on the uh, water there um, i was looking at it online and a studio apartment i mean now that we're talking about how crazy expensive things are get a load of this guys a studio apartment in the new uh, rental building that went up right along the boardwalk in long beach a studio starts at $3,000. That's like Manhattan prices now in Long Beach. That's crazy. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe they'll rent them. I mean, maybe there's the demand for that. But $3,000 US dollars for a studio apartment in Long Beach, New York. To me, I don't know. A little crazy, but the building looks nice. I think it's going to have a pool. It has all the amenities. Um, it's right on Shore Road. All right, let me catch up on some of these chats. Apologize. Peter Webley says you can buy in Iowa for 100,000 100, or 150K. Well, yeah, but, you know, it's location, location. Ah, Beach Fox is, yes, looking at a unit there. Uh, top oceanfront going for 4.5 million, yeah. So one of my, well, a broker that our team works with a lot, uh, he's on the Noble Black team. I think he's running the sales at that new development there. So if you're interested in it, just shoot me an email and I'll put you in touch with them. Uh, they work right out of my office right there at 575 Madison. It's a cool project. Um, maybe I'll go out there and check it out. Hey, Arsenal Fan 13, thank you so much for your very generous $5 donation. Appreciate it. This is Tom. Speaking of homes, I sent you a Newsday article. Oh, yeah, you did send me a Newsday article about how Long Island has the most million dollar uh, cities in New York State. 50 towns in Long Island out of 66. Yeah, Long Island is very expensive now, um, unfortunately. And not only is it expensive in terms of the sticker price, so in terms of the list price, it's also very expensive in terms of the taxes.
This is the Steinway Tower. Now, you know what I never noticed? Probably because the scaffolding just came down. Look at how nice the apartments are right above the Angelo's Pizza. It looks like they just redid the entire facade here. Right on 57th Street. See, when the city has so much scaffolding all over the place, you kind of forget like the beauty of the facades. Because it's just covered with nonsense all the time. Wow, Richard Vogel says my property taxes are $17,000 a year. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the only place in America that has Nassau and Suffolk County beat in terms of property taxes, I think some parts in New Jersey may be a little bit more expensive, I think. Don't quote me on that, but um, yeah. However, you know, on the other hand, you know, not to just complain, Long Island, New York does have some of the best public school districts in the entire nation. Not only in New York, but in the entire nation. I think Oceanside School District is like ranked in the top 10 public school districts. You have Jericho. Um, so I guess you get what you pay for in, in a way, but there is a lot of corruption on Long Island, which we won't talk too much about. We don't want to end up in a bucket of cement. Hey, Joe, what's going on? Good to see you. All right, let's head back towards uh, 34th Street, Penn Station. That's where we have to go anyway. This is the F train. Oh, it's the F train again. I thought they changed it to the M train. Interesting. Beach Fox is Tom. The taxes on that unit are five thousand a month with the four thousand HOA. I'm only paying seventeen thousand in taxes now. It's actually not too bad on a three million dollar house. Seventeen thousand in tax. It's actually a pretty good deal, dude. Um, I know some people in Oceanside, like one point five million dollar properties. Their tax bills are pushing thirty, like twenty seven thousand uh, dollar property tax bills. Which is wild. I mean, think about that. So even if you own your house free and clear, you got to write that big check for 30 big ones every year. Whew, crazy. Crazy, crazy. All right, let's pull off to the side here. I got to plug in the phone. This is by Fortress Investments. West 55th. Hey, Sabrina Fair, what's going on? Welcome to New York on this crazy day. Today was a wild day in New York. Lots of crazy stuff going on, but hopefully things will improve this weekend. All right, let me just plug this my phone in here. Ed Dunkel, what's up? All right, let's 
let's head down. This is the Lions Bernstein. Nelson's is you're always having battery issues. Uh, I wouldn't say the battery is having an issue. You know, when you're streaming at 1080p for two hours, it tends to put a little bit of wear and tear on the battery. You know, you gotta plug it in. This is the flagship Hilton Hotel. Three T3s, and that's why people leave. High taxes equal they leave. Eh, generally, I'd say that um, when you see the degradation of the city with the high taxes, that's when they leave. But if everything is like a utopia and it's awesome and you have high taxes, not so much. People are generally willing to pay the high taxes if things are in order. When people get pissed off, it's when they pay all these high taxes and then they have to deal with all the nonsense. One of the things we spoke about is this trend of everybody you know, buying a place in Texas over the pandemic. And I said that there's a lot of people that are not gonna do their diligence into the property taxes there in Texas. And they're gonna think they're gonna save a bunch of money and then they're gonna hit, get hit with a crazy property tax bill. Because when you purchase a property at, the new, at a new value, it reassesses. And your taxes are now based on the new assessed value. And Texas, depending on where you are, has very, very high property tax. Now it's true that they don't have any state income tax, but if you're not prepared for that tax bill, I mean, your jaw is gonna be on the floor. It is what it is, you know? There's only two things that are guaranteed in this life. You have to pay your taxes and we're all gonna die at some point. So death and taxes are the two things that are guaranteed. To get out of this area.
I think the further south we go, we'll be able to get out of the buffer zone. Here we have Del Frisco's. Hey. Avenue of the Americas. Let's make this left and we'll go all the way back to 34th Street. We'll try to avoid 6th. I was reading an article about these uh, pedicab people. Apparently the city's gonna crack down really, really hard on them because there's been a lot of complaints and a lot of car damage, I guess, from these guys ramming into cars and just taking off. Also, they create a lot of traffic. I definitely see that around Penn Station. Tons and tons of traffic getting out of Madison Square Garden. And you'll just see 10, 20 of those pedicab guys. the best way to navigate Times Square. Least amount of traffic. I think we'll have to go one more over. because the pedestrian traffic is going to be way too much.
All right, I think we're out of it. I think this is where the Church of Scientology is. Maybe just off to the right, I think. Right around the corner, this is where the new torch building is going to be built. There's going to be about 850 room hotel and a drop ride attraction on top. If you want to look at some of the renderings, you can just Google the torch New York City. We're about to pass the construction site. They've already started construction on it too. Okay, 48th Street and 8th Avenue. This is by the main FDNY. Engine 54. M.M. What's up? Happy Friday to you. Welcome to 8th Avenue. We're pretty much going to take this all the way down to 34th Street, Penn Station. Oh, is that right? Joe says there's a lot of panhandlers in Toronto. There's a lot of them here too. But oftentimes here, they're a little bit more creative. Some of the more sophisticated panhandlers here are more into the uh, deception. All right, guys, here it is, 748th Avenue. This, this thing is gonna be crazy. So the developer is Xtel. Here, let's cross the street on Restaurant Row. You guys gotta Google the rendering as we're looking at the development site here. Trust me, just do it. I know you're probably laying down on the couch watching TV, but pick up your phone or the laptop and Google the renderings of 7408th Avenue. There's gonna be a super tall building right in this lot, right here. It's gonna be about an 850 room hotel and this crazy drop ride attraction on top. It's gonna to be insane. Let me see if I have a picture of it. No, I don't, I can't. Anyway, it's gonna be right here in this big vacant lot. They've already started to pour the concrete for the uh, foundation.
Now, some of the panhandlers in New York City, they'll like, uh, they'll be the fake monks. So oftentimes, if you're walking around New York, like Times Square or something like that, you'll see like a group of these monks and you'll think like, wow, these are real monks. That's interesting. They're raising money for like a Buddhist temple or something. There's, there's no temple, it doesn't exist. And they just essentially take your money and they give you these, you know, $2 like bead bracelets. Oh, that was almost a big collision with this food delivery bike guy going the wrong way. Yikes. Yeah, Eddie, it says it looks like a torch. That's the name of the building. It's called The Torch. Gary Burnett and Extel is uh, on the development there. It'd be able to see it in real time here live. Sorry about that. This is a Shake Shack. You guys are never gonna believe this. I actually got Shake Shack tonight for dinner. Hey, Janice S. Welcome to New York. Very busy tonight. Lots of tourist activity. Yeah, Eddie says the architecture of the building is insane. Can't wait till it's finished. Well, it's funny that you say that, Eddie, because I think we took a poll in the chat. This was like a month ago when they just released the renderings and an overwhelming majority of the chat hated the architecture. I guess it's just an acquired taste. Now, for comparison, I remember, like it was yesterday, I remember exactly when 432 Park Avenue topped out. There were so many negative articles written about it, blasting how ugly it looked, 432 Park. And at first I kind of agreed with it. I was like, you know, it is a little bit of a weird design, but now it's one of my favorite buildings in the city. So I think it grows on you over time. And who knows, maybe the torch will grow on me also over time. I think it makes a little, it makes New York City look a little bit more like Vegas. I don't know, that's just maybe. Oh, yikes. NYPD trying to get through. There's a big, uh, big ring blocking the place. Hey, Jonathan from Florida, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend. Oh, yikes, what do we got here? Yeah, Hawaii's like you didn't like it at first. Yeah, it's just like it was a little too weird. But now I actually really like it. Now, Hawaii, I previewed one of the units in there and you gotta see this thing in person. Next time you come to New York, let me know. I'll try to get you in there. But if you're on a higher floor, I'd say if you're over the 20th floor, the 10 foot by 10 foot windows are like surreal. You can stand inside the windows and you have these unobstructed views of the city all over Central Park. It's just like perfectly centered everywhere you go. And I think that's what makes me like the building. Um, if you wanna see, you know, for those of you who wanna see some renderings, 
Just go to Street Easy, type in 432 Park, and look at some of the listings. And the windows, every single unit has these big 10 foot by 10 foot floor to ceiling glass windows. They're insane. Hopefully very soon our team will have a resale listing in there. Fingers crossed. Right, Port Authority. This is the Port Authority bus terminal right here. smell here is just whew, crazy. Bad, bad, bad. But the good news is there's plans to totally rip and replace the Port Authority bus terminal, which is going to be good. Which I think is going to really revitalize the neighborhood. MD. Now, MD, I'm not sure if you knew this, but I was actually in a union back in the day. This was when I first started my sales career. I was in local 1101, CWA, Communication Workers of America. And uh, I still have the newspaper because it was the first time in, I think, 15 years or something, our union went on strike. And you could see, if you guys find it, you could probably Google my name, CWA. I was in Lower Manhattan, uh, right outside of the Beekman, Five Beekman Place, I think it was called. And uh, you could see me on the picket line protesting. Hilarious. I didn't really want to do it, but if you don't do it, they call you a scab, I think. So I'm like, yeah, I'll have some fun with it. I got to find, I, I think I have a... Uh, some photos of it. I had a bandana, like a CWA Communication Workers of America bandana. This was, what was it, 2016? Something like that. But yeah, it's funny because sometimes when we have these conversations at night, you know, some people will say, Tom, you're anti union. You hate the unions. I was in a union. Anyway. Oof. Ah, here's a cannabis dispensary. <laughs> Robinson says, let's follow a paper trade portfolio for fun. Very early on, I thought about that, but then I was advised against doing it, which I kind of agree now. I think I could get out of hand and could be irresponsible because people will probably commit real capital to it and I'll be blamed and I don't really want to get involved in that but uh no so Peter it was more like uh I was working for AT&T at the time and and first let me say it was a great experience you get really really good training uh, if you're in, in my experience, right? Some people have bad experience being in union. I had great training. I got a lot of certifications, uh, learning all about telecommunications networks, learning about pretty much anything and everything telecom, uh, you learned about. 
you know, traditional MPLS networks, you know, how to convert them to SD-WAN. You, you actually got like a, it was kind of like going to a trade school, but you got paid to do it. You go to all these trainings, these courses, it was good. And the pay at the time was really good for the, for my age. Brian says, you headed towards the Hudson Yards. We are headed towards the Hudson Yards. This is West 36th Street and 8th Avenue. Right on the right, you have the New Yorker Hotel. But we're probably not gonna go all the way to the Hudson Yards tonight. We'll probably do that tomorrow night, Saturday night's live stream. There was recently a wild story um, about the New Yorker Hotel. There was this guy that tried to take over the whole hotel. So he was essentially a squatter in the hotel room. They couldn't get him out. And then he was trying to build a case to say that he owned the entire hotel. And it actually, they had to take him to court to get him out. It was wild. Here you have it, the New Yorker Hotel. Dance and squatters are becoming the mad science. Well, I will say this. I'm going to make a prediction. All the crazy squatter nonsense that you're seeing in the news right now in New York, probably within the next year, there's going to be some major, major legislation passed that's going to put an end to all that here. Because there's a lot of big money that are really, really upset about it, and it's deterring investment into the city. And a lot of people that are trying to raise money for funds are not going to be able to raise it here. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on these politicians to uh, make that problem go away. So I think it will go away. And it should go away. I mean, that's ridiculous. The whole thing about, you know, squatters' rights. There shouldn't be any squatters' rights. These people are criminals. It's ridiculous. The big problem is this though, right? Just to kind of play devil's advocate. The problem is, it's not like you can't get the tenants out. You can get the tenants out. That's a myth that you can't get them out. You can. We have a, a process, a legal procedure that you go through with the courts and you can get them out. Here's the problem. Okay, this is the key. The problem is the courts in New York are so backed up that it takes forever. The process isn't streamlined at all. It takes forever. That's why you hear these stories that it could take, you know, five months, six months, a year to get these people out. Um, you know, I would even argue a lot of these squatters are now a part of these organized crime rings, which I would consider, where they know how to game the system, they know how to defer and, you know, roll out the court dates but it's not like you can't get them out. You can. It's just the process is very, very laborious. It takes a long time, and it's gonna—it's probably gonna cost you a lot of money. You know, if it gets to the point, maybe the squatter will try to make a deal with you and say, "Hey, I'll leave." It's like called cash for keys, right? I call it extortion, but that's just me. Anyway, if you guys are enjoying or have enjoyed the live stream so far tonight,
feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. We do these streams almost every single night starting at 8.30. Yeah, stances, the legislatures are beginning to revamp their squatter laws. You're gonna see it, it's gonna go away in New York in a major, major way. And I think that's gonna spur a huge turnaround in New York. All right, Vernado, Pen 2 Project. So now that we're coming up on the end of the stream, where should we stream tomorrow? What do you guys think? Should we start from Dumbo, Brooklyn and walk over the Brooklyn Bridge? I guess depending on the weather. I don't know, maybe we'll do something cool tomorrow. Maybe Soho, we'll walk around Soho, West Village. Fingers crossed the weather's good. If the weather's good tomorrow, I think we'll make a beeline to the West Village. Ah, Chinatown, Richard Vogel. It's a good idea. Ah, Hawaii's is Brooklyn. You guys want Dumbo? Lease is Fort Lauderdale. Ha! I wish. I wish, man. You and me both. Staten Island. Maybe we'll do that Sunday. We'll uh, jump on the Staten Island ferry. Someone says walk over the Queensboro Bridge. You know, we've done that before, but it's loud. Queensboro Bridge is loud to walk over. I don't know, maybe we'll do it in Brooklyn. Anyway, all right guys, it's time for us to go. Um, but I hope all of you enjoy your weekend. We need a good weekend because this week was tough on Wall Street. Everybody took a beating, we took one on the chin, but next week is a new week. So thank you all for joining us. Have a fantastic weekend. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a like on the video, and we will meet right back here tomorrow night at 8.30, probably from Dumbo, Brooklyn. We'll walk over the Brooklyn Bridge. We'll check out Lower Manhattan, Soho, the West Village, and Chinatown. So take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. God bless, and uh, yeah, see you tomorrow. Take care, everybody.